pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor uh, Leo Kauenhoek of the uh, Cathay Institute of Nanoscience of the Delft University of Technology. Uh, Professor Kauenhoek has been at Delft since he started his master studies in 1988. He promoted to PhD cum laude in 1992, and he's been a full professor at Delft uh, since 1999, where he leads the quantum transport group. Um, so Professor Kaunov's group is well known in the condensed matter community for uh, many experimental achievements in fabricating and measuring the properties of tiny quantum devices, such as, for example, qubits, which are the uh, building blocks of quantum computers. And for this research, he uh, received dozens of awards and honors, uh, perhaps most notably the Spinoza Award in 2007, which is the most important uh, Dutch scientific honor. And uh, besides the fundamental uh, science, he's also the founding director of the QTEC Advanced Research Center for Quantum Technologies, which was founded at uh, Delft campus in uh, 2013. And the QTEC project's main goal is to create a uh, first working prototype of a quantum computer in six years with the uh, combined efforts of leading scientists and um, the high-tech industry. So this QTEC innovation um, was jump-started by recent breakthroughs, uh, which reached climax in 2012, when its group published uh, the results of a series of experiments in science, which showed for the first time signatures of uh, exotic quasi particles, known as Majorana fermions, in a, in a very complicated device, which was proposed by, by theorists two years earlier. And uh, for his, uh, his discovery, he, he gained a lot of uh, attention also from a wider audience. And he made a, a noteworthy appearance in the Dutch media, where he uh, explained his uh, discovery on a popular talk show using a Duplo bricks <laughs> to kind of create his device. And uh, okay, so what these Majorana fermions are and how they relate to uh, quantum computers is the subject of uh, today's talk. Uh, the quest for uh, Majorana particles. Thank you very much. That was a very nice introduction. Uh, I was actually born in Delft, so I've been there all the time, not starting at the master, but one thing I want to correct. <laughs> I also want to say, maybe more about that, the other thing that you mentioned, that in Holland, Cum laude actually means something. <laughs> we don't have the summa, summa, summa. So that, uh, yeah. that is something that uh, I'm proud of. Uh, you also said we have six years, we promised six years for building a quantum computer. I'm not sure that we're going to make it. <laughs> don't tell anybody else, but uh, let's be careful. But today's subject is about uh, Majorana fermions, Majorana particles. And uh, we're hunting for this uh, very special particle. And we're actually doing that in competition with uh, uh, particle physicists uh, who are looking for Majorana fermions as, as, as a cosmic race. And then to detect the Majorana fermions from the cosmos, they are building huge detectors in uh, caves, inside mountains, filled with liquid that is you know, sensitive to scattering events with you know, possibly a Majorana fermion. The approach that we have is completely the opposite. So our detector is very small. This is a, a huge zoom in on our device. It's, uh, in reality, it's less than a micrometer. So you cannot see it with bare eye. And also our team of people is not you know, a big group of particle physicists. It's about you know, 10 people who can do the experiment. So it's an entirely different approach. Nevertheless, it's interesting that uh, uh, we are hunting for a particle, a particle that was predicted by uh, Mr. Majorana, Ettore Majorana, in 1937, I believe. It's a long time ago. And since then, uh, both the, uh, mostly the, the, uh, the, uh, the particle physicists you know, have been you know, hunting for this Majorana frame. It's a very simple definition, and it's uh, given by this symmetry relation that it says actually that the operator to make up uh, the Majorana fermion is the same as the operator to delete it. Or in other words, 
in this sense, this was means that the particle, the Majoran fermion, is actually equal to its own antiparticle. Now, if you have this symmetry that the particle is the same as its antiparticle, it means immediately a few things. That's because if it, has, if, if it would have a finite energy, then the antiparticle would have the opposite negative energy. Or if it would have a finite charge, the opposite antiparticle would have, you know, so the opposite charge. Spin, same story. So this symmetry already tells you that it's a particle that has, you know, a lot of nothings. Right? The energy is zero, the spin is zero, uh, the charge is zero. Now, the symmetry is actually okay for bosons. Yeah? So it's a photon or also a Higgs boson is its own antiparticle. It's special for fermions. And then it then becomes something that we haven't seen before. Now, given the fact that everything is zero, how do you actually detect a particle with everything zero? And that makes it so difficult also for the cosmic Majoranus to actually you know, get an event a tick in your detector. There's nice, two nice reviews from Frank Wilczek, an authority, Nobel laureate in particle physics who wrote two reviews where he actually makes the connection between the cosmic Majoranus and also the condensed matter Majoranus. And they are similar they are, but also, yeah, there are also many aspects where they are different. Now the fact that, you know, the particle was predicted in 1937, and uh, we, everybody has been looking for it for so many decades, is actually, there's, there's actually a kind of, kind of a sad analogy also with the, of the, uh, the man who predicted this particle. Because the man, Sora Majorana, one year after he predicted uh, this particle, he disappeared himself. And so he, uh, he just left. He actually was working in uh, Naples, and he uh, took the boat to Palermo. Before he took the boat, he uh, actually took all his cash from uh, the bank. Uh, that's kind of suspicious. You take all your cash from the bank. And then uh, took the boat to Palermo. He bought a ticket, but that's the last thing that people have seen of him. And this, this little piece in the newspaper asked, you know, did anybody see Ettore mm -hmm. Maidan? Piece that started, that, that was in the newspaper in 1938. <laughs> and literally, if, if you, I'm not, I'm not sure if there are uh, Italian people here, but you know, the, people are still making it. He's, he's world famous in Italy. So there's still documentaries, books being written, or, or you know, all kinds of conspiracies where he could have been since 1938. And really, it is still alive, that story, because if you can read Italian, this is actually a, a, a screenshot from a, the website from an Italian uh, journal from last week, 2015, February, where, you know, you can all, of course, all translate this. Uh, Ettore Majorana, uh, what is the prosecutor of Rome, says that he was still living between 1955 and 1959. And then people have seen him, that he was identified in those years, uh, and now the prosecutor in Rome has made it official. Now, if you also read this text, it actually says some, some famous names. I actually know what it says because there's also an English translation. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the news from last week. You know, apparently his disappearance, or we thought well, his disappearance was not a suicide according to the Rome prosecutors. He was just, you know, Hiding somewhere. So the story is still on. And at the end of this presentation, I actually also have some news on, about the man. So this is last week's news. If you have some you know, even more recent news about Hector Mayoran himself. But physics, everyone has this particle. Uh, what do we know about particles? Well, particles are actually, uh, the definition of a particle is actually uh, that they must be a solution of the Dirac equation. That's the definition. Particle, they only uh, exist because they are solutions of the Dirac equation, with one exception, and that's the one that Majorana proposed. He slightly modified the Dirac equation <coughs> and found a new solution, a solution where the operator to make the particle is the same as the operator to the UV. In terms of uh, symbols and operators, you can uh, write this. And that, uh, actually, if you have this C dagger, it means that you have an empty state and you have this operator acting on the empty state, then you fill it with one <coughs> fermion. If you have the annihilation operator, that it operates on a filled state, you actually empty it. 
And that's all you basically need to know. And you know that quantum mechanics has uh, solutions which are complex numbers. And that makes it so strange. So you can write those also as operators as a, as a complex number. And it's a real and imaginary part. And you know, this, this operator for creating, for instance, let's take an electron as the example for fermions. This is the operator to make an electron, this is one to, to annihilate or create a hole. Now, not doing anything special, just rewriting these two little equations, you can express the gamma in terms of the fermion operators, or the gamma, but also this gamma 2 in terms of these fermion operators. And it's this operator, gamma 1, and also this operator, gamma 2, that are our Majorans. If you check, you take, if you take the complex conjugate, then you see it's actually equal to its you know, self joint, as I said. Both for gamma 1. So it's just rewriting the normal operators for making fermions you know, and expressing them in a, in, a, in a new way, you get the Majorans. And if you look at this, this gamma, there's a factor of one half in front, but loosely speaking, a Majoran you know, is half an electron. So what is so special? I mean, if, if it's just rewriting uh, a complex number, what is special about it? Well, it's not special at all, it's very trivial, unless you can do something special to it. So suppose that you have you know, one fermion, like an electron, and you can break, it's an elementary particle, so you can't do it, but imagine that you can break it in two pieces and bring the two pieces apart. And for instance, if there is one piece has, uh, that also has a, you, know, you know that electron has an internal momentum, the spin. If you can break it in two pieces where the upspin goes here and the downspin goes to the other side. That would be very interesting because the spin flip, usually on a single electron, is very easy because you know, that single electron can flip you know, just by turning its magnetic moment. But if you separate the spin up and the spin down states, it becomes very difficult because scattering or flipping its spin requires as well you know, a long trap or a long jump of the distance. So if you can do something like that, you have something special. If you can break the particle into pieces, put them far away, then they have become a, uh, 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 a new particle, we call it a quasi-particle, and, and we actually do it in solid state. And what you require is some kind of topological properties, in this case, topological protection. Now, there are some keywords here, and these keywords I like to give you some examples or explain a little bit what, these, what the meaning is for condensed matter physics uh, of topological properties quasi-particles, and also what it means to be an emerging state arising from collective behavior. And you can also read about it, there are some reviews, and also a very nice one in Physics Today from 2012, written by uh, one of the early people, theorists in the field, Nick Reed. Now, first of all, topological properties. We have some examples of topological systems, the, easy, the simplest classical one is the Möbius ring, and you just make a twist in it, and if you deform the, the ring, the number of twists in the ring doesn't change. It's, it's protected, in the twist number is protected against small deformations. You really have to cut open the ring and you know, reattach it to change the twist number. Now we actually know of a similar effect in the, what's called the quantum Hall effect. Where you have a two-dimensional system, magnetic field, then if you measure its electrical properties, what you get is, is a graph like this. This is the, the resistance. This is actually the function of magnetic field. It's very complicated stuff here, but if you look at this upper, this is the Hall phase resistance, and you see these flat regions, these are plateaus. And the beauty of the quantum Hall effect is that these values at these plateaus are quantized. They're quantized at exact values of h over e squared, Planck's constant divided by the electron charge squared. An exact at least with an accuracy what people have measured today, is about 10 digits. So this is a quantum effect. It is the resistance is quantized by the use of you know, Planck's constant. There's nothing else. What can be more quantum than Planck's constant? And the beauty is that it doesn't matter how big the sample is. It doesn't have to be rectangular. It, doesn't, it can be any shape, any size. It's independent of size and shape. And that's what makes the system topological. You can make it two times bigger, but this Hall resistance quantized at this h of e squared, 
stays the same. Now you can think of this, this these transfer properties, if I go back, as that you know, the current flows actually only at the edges of the sample, and it doesn't really matter how much you know, spacing is between these two channels at the edges. Now the similar picture for one-dimensional systems, that's what we, we will be looking at, is like this. And that instead of, and I've already shown you this picture of this, this, this electron broken in two pieces uh, in one dimension, that in a one-dimensional system, the two interesting pieces are at the two ends of the system, and independent of the length in between them, you know, that, that doesn't change the state. It's all it, it, the, the, pro the properties are completely determined by the end states, and the piece in between doesn't matter anymore. So that will be actually you know, our you know, thing to study today. Okay, what else we have? Collective behavior. Now, this uh, I cannot make any simpler than to illustrate the collective behavior by a train. As a train is a collection of uh, wagons, the wagons are all connected together. The wagons, therefore, can no longer freely move themselves. They're completely locked in one single motion of everything moving as you know, one full train. If I'm looking at excitations of this train, I want to perturb this new system, then you know, I can try to kick out one of the wagons in the middle, but that will be a high energy excitation. You will find your low energy excitations at the first or last wagon of the train. These are you know, easier to disconnect. So a one-dimensional system, and this is actually a pretty good prediction for one-dimensional systems. For one-dimensional systems, you will find these excitations you know, somewhere at the end. If I connect this to you know, electrons, and electrons uh, are <coughs> sealed orange disks here, and I have a one-dimensional wire, and I fill up the one-dimensional wire almost completely except one state. Yeah, so you can think of it as seats. All the seats are occupied <coughs> except the one over here. This is an empty seat, and that's what we call a hole. Now we can ask the electrons all to move one seat over, and that means that yeah, the hole, in effect, jumps over a large distance. Yeah, so everybody moves over a little bit, the empty seat goes to the other side of the room. So that's what collective behavior can do. Uh, you have a, a whole state, and that's filled, creating a whole state on the other side. If it, if it happens fast, you know, it's, you know, it goes back and forth, that whole state. And we know that something that goes back and forth fast, then in quantum mechanics, it can also be in a superposition. And uh, that's a classical picture. Superposition would be that the whole would be on the left and right side at the same time. So again, yeah, I, was, I started to think about the whole jumping back and forth. I can do a new, let's say, a transformation. I think about the particle, and now I see, if I just look at this particle, that it's actually a superposition of an electron and a hole. So instead of a spatial superposition, it's now a particle superposition. Where this piece at the end is half an electron and half a hole, and then, you know, to conserve particle, we also have one on the, on the other side. <coughs> Uh, that particle, that is exactly our Majorana. This symbol in my talk will be you know, the, the, the equal superposition of an electron and hole. That's our Majorana. Now, you can actually show, and I will give you an example, but what you need to make this exactly half, so an equal superposition, you actually need a superconductor and a magnetic field. But under the right circumstances, you can mathematically show that these two objects are indeed Majorana fermions. Now, this is a cartoon picture. If you wish, you can also look at a Hamiltonian you know, with the superconducting correlations in a Hamiltonian. <coughs> that was done in a beautiful, actually still simple paper by Alexei Kitaya from 2001. And uh, what you see here in this figure two from his paper is, is, is how, what, what, what Cooper pairs can do. You probably know that in a superconductor, uh, electrons are paired in a, you know, in, in a Cooper pair, so they have charge 2E. And they move you know, as, as an object, uh, as, a, as a solid no, 2E object. Now, how can you pair up? There are actually two ways to pair up. You can pair up by, for instance, uh, hugging somebody. And then, you, know, you are a pair. Or you can also maybe you know, hug or, or pair up and you, know, you just uh, cross, you, you, you put your arms in each other. And there's an important phase transition if you go from <coughs> hugging to putting your, uh, connecting by arms. If you're hugging, 
Yeah, then you're connected to your partner. And uh, if you have an even number in the audience, then everybody can be connected. Yeah, it's, it's good. If you have your, if you're connected by arms, you know, in a line, then yeah, there will be an empty arm on one side as well as an empty arm on the other side. Again, and these are the two excitations from the train, and it's exactly this type different difference in pairing that gives you in the end one type of superconductor or a different type of superconductor. And this is the one that has the Majoranas at the end. If you're a superconducting specialist, this is what we know as an S-wave superconductor, and this is what we know as a P-wave superconductor. And I'll come back to that. But it really comes down to the way, to the precise way of pairing mechanism between electrons. All right. So this was sort of no, Kitaev, but if you look at Kitaev's paper, it's really mathematical. It's, there's a Hamiltonian, there's some tricks in mathematics, some transformations, and I didn't read that paper in 2001. I, I could have tried, but it wouldn't have made you know, much of an impression on me. But then there were some papers, particularly these two papers, Lutjin et al. and Orak et al. that appeared in 2010, that translated the Kitaev uh, proposal into a more practical pr proposal where they could really literally write out do this, do that. We give you a recipe and if you make it apply a magnetic field, then there should be Majoranas in your system. And there were four ingredients in this Majorana recipe. One is that you need a one-dimensional system. Two is that you need spin orbit interaction. Three is that you need superconductivity and you have to apply a magnetic field. So what I'd like to do is to go a little bit through these four ingredients separately before we put them together and get to the minorities. Now, starting with uh, one-dimensional systems, we are collaborating with uh, material growers in Eindhoven, Erik Bakkers and his group, uh, that grow uh, uh, semiconductor wires out of a catalytic particle, and they can be long and kind of skinny wires. This is a particular example of indium and timonite wire they have a certain crystal structure, they glow along a certain axis, now well, a few micrometers long, and the diameter is now between 50 and 100 nanometers. Now we particularly choose this material for reasons that I will explain in a minute, but is that this special semiconductor has a very strong spin orbit interaction. Now we take these wires from air buckers, and we make a very simple uh, device out of it. And we, we put it on a substrate, we make contact to that uh, uh, single wire. It's actually a gate electrode underneath in the system, somewhere in the substrate. So you can do a measurement of the electrical properties as a function of the gate voltage uh, applied to, the, to, to this gate. This is a picture of the device. Take it after the measurement, and you actually see that, that, that by after measuring it, this piece of another wire in the middle is actually blown up. So it acts like a fuse. You know, if, you, if you don't treat it carefully, mm -hmm. no, it's just a gap. If you measure the conductance from here to here through the another wire as a function of the back gate voltage, and what the back gate voltage does if you make it more negative, it just you know, pushes away the electrons. At some point, there are no electrons left in the wire. The conductance should go to zero. It spins off. And indeed, uh, the conductance goes to zero. Interestingly, you see that it's a little plateau, very similar to the quantum Hall effect, but now it's zero magnetic field at a particular value. And we've taken you know, these measurements at you know, 10 different devices or so. And you know, all of these devices, they all have their own characteristic, their own personality, but you see a plateau at this value you know, in all these devices. And there's also you know, a signature of a second or a third plateau. What it means is that what we can read off from these measurements is that the transport actually in this system is, is, is quantum. And there, are, there are quantized states in, in this nanowire, one dimensional subbands, and the conductance through a one dimensional subband is actually 2 e squared over h. This is still in current, but if you translate it to conductance, you get exactly the value of 2 e squared over h. And you see that all these devices give you the same uh, value. I'm actually showing here and there some data on, the bit, on white slides. That means that's very fresh data. This data was taken you know, last you know, few weeks ago or so, not published, not polished. Uh, it's, it's really fresh. But if I show data on a white slide, it's fresh. And if it's uh, you know, colored and uh, massaged, then you know, 
may, may look uh, good, then it's about a chance. But this is, this is actually a very nice result. Okay, next is the uh, uh, spin orbit interaction. And spin orbit interaction is uh, that, you know, simply that the electron has a spin, electron has an orbit or a motion, it can move. And in materials with a spin orbit interaction, then when it moves, the spin also rotates. Right? There's no spin orbit interaction, yeah? but with spin orbit interaction, it just moves. You can also say that the spin or the orbit by itself are no longer good quantum numbers. There's some mixture of spin and orbit that becomes a good quantum number. Crown or state. So what is the spin orbit interaction in this system? What does it do? Well, if I have, if I, if I have a one-dimensional system, it can only propagate in one direction in the electron along, let's say, the k-direction positive momentum, or the negative momentum, this is positive, this is negative momentum. It moves as a free electron, so it's a quadratic dispersion, energy versus k. And if you know, nothing special, then the spin up and spin down states are degenerate at zero magnetic field. <coughs> this spin orbit interaction, what happens is actually that the spin and the orbits become coupled, such that for the up spin is coupled to the motion in, let's say, with a positive sign, which moves this parabola to the left, and the down spin with a negative sign, which moves the parabola to the, to the right. Shifting the two parabolas, there's now a single point only where they are, they have an overlap. But if I apply a magnetic field that has another particular angle, then these two states start to mix up, and you create a gap right at that point. So now I only have two points here. If I, if I, for instance, if I, if I fill my system with electrons such that the Fermi energy is right in this gap here, that means that at the Fermi energy, all the electrons that move to the right, the positive momentum, have spin down. And all the electrons that move to the left have spin up. And so spin and momentum is not completely correlated. <coughs> they move this way, they move the other way, and they separate. Now this is something that, uh, uh, this, this effect of the, the, the subbands and how strong is the spin orbit interaction in Enium and Timonite, we've measured in some experiments, actually not so long ago, this is from 2014, doing weak localization and anti-weak localization measurements. But the upshot is that in, at, the, at the end of the day, we measure a value of about one milli electron volt for the spin orbit interaction. That translates to a distance of about well, 30, 40, uh, 50 nanometers for the electrons to travel to change the spin by pi. And that's the uh, This number, one millivolt, <coughs> corresponds to 50 nanometer in spin orbit length. So that's, that's a number, if you, you know, compare it to the temperature, that's several Kelvin, maybe four Kelvin of temperature. All right, so next is superconductivity. What can we say about superconductivity? Well, first of all is that in a superconductor, I already said that electrons are paired, and in a Coulomb pair, but there's an underlying symmetry in a superconductor that you know, is obeyed by all superconductors. And that symmetry is, is, is given here, is that if you create a particle, an electron-like particle at a positive energy, then there must also be a state of negative energy, at exactly the same energy. And there is an opposite state with the whole character at the opposite energy of the electron state. So this is like you know, a particle hole, in this case, uh, electron hole symmetry relation. So you can say, that, okay, that's, that's a great starting point because we want this at zero energy. Yeah, but so if we start here, then somehow maybe we can make it you know, go to zero energy. And then we are in business. Now this symmetry relation actually if you, if you know what Andreev reflections, this sort of a picture is over here, is that the sum of an electron at positive and negative energy can create a Cook pair in the condensate of a supernova. Good. Now, there were two people. They found a trick. So how do you, it's basically an open question, right? You know, this is a symmetry that superconductors have. If you want it at zero energy to get a Majorana, how do you get it? And there were two people. Uh, Fu and Kane, who came up with a good idea. Now here's the following. First of all, an example where it doesn't work. An example is actually uh, starting with a superconducting film. This, this, this layer of superconductor S extends in this direction. It's a film of superconductor. You apply a magnetic field, and it creates pockets where it can penetrate some magnetic flux lines. And these pockets are known as vortices. And they are, you know, regions where the superconducting but the superconductor becomes normal, 
and where the field can penetrate. Now the superconductor, if, if I now have you know, an electron in this normal conductor bouncing back and forth against the superconductor, it cannot simply enter the superconductor, it is reflected by the gap. Now this reflection by the gap, we actually recognize immediately as a particle in the box problem, but now the walls of the box are uh, formed by the superconductor. If you solve the eigenstates of a particle in the box, then you get some, some values. But the important point is that there's always a zero point energy. And there's always this factor of one half that you cannot reduce to zero. And it's, there's always a finite vacuum fluctuation or zero point energy that lifts the lowest energy state to a finite value. These numbers, or these red lines are the particle in the box states that we know from the textbook examples, and the mirror symmetry is from the property of the superconductor, that you use superconducting walls instead of not superconducting walls. Now, Fuhr again, what they thought about was that if you make your walls special, and meaning special in the sense that if an electron bounces off the wall, it actually also gets a phase shift going back, and then get another phase shift going back, so it forms a standing wave with additional phase shifts picked up by a special superconductor, then they found a solution where there was actually a single state at zero energy. So then the question is, what kind of walls do you need? And they found that you need a wall that's made out of a P-wave superconductor. That gives you, as a solution, a state at zero energy. Now, what is a P-wave superconductor? They, are, yeah, they may exist in nature, but nobody has found a P-wave superconductor from natural material. But the idea is that in a normal, what's called an S-wave superconductor, the Cooper pairing of two particles is, a, is accompanied by uh, having two particles with opposite spin. So the total spin of the Cooper pair is zero. And that's an S-wave pairing. Whereas in this case, the, the, the Cooper pair is paired. Again, still up, but then with the same spin. And that also has an effect on the orbital part of the, of the superconductor. And that's then called the so, not existing in nature, but yeah, okay, at least we have changed the problem from, you know, finding Majoranas to change the problem finding P-wave superconductors, and then, you know, go from there. That may be simple. Now, we have been studying superconductors for a long time in Delft, I actually know also many people here in Antwerp have been super, uh, studying superconductors for a long time. We've made some nine devices already 10 years ago where we have aluminum as a superconductor. These three stripes are aluminum contacts. Here's a semiconductor nanowire. What we found is that you can actually send a current of Cooper pairs, a supercurrent, via this non-superconducting semiconductor nanowire out into the other superconductor. And you can do that over distances of about a micrometer. And so you do the experiment, you send the current through the system. And what you find is that even up to 100 nanoamps, you know, a significant current, the voltage across the sample is still zero. So there's no dissipation at all, uh, although the cool pairs have to transverse, traverse, you know, a one, almost a one micrometer, we have up to one micrometer distance you know, in, in the semiconductor. Now, at that time, we, you know, I, had, if, I wish I had read, because uh, it was 2005, the Kitaev papers, but you know, I have no knowledge of Kitaev, so we actually stopped this research. We thought that they were boring, you know, let's do something else. So then in 2010, the recipe from, from Horek and Luchin came, and we picked it up again. So now we're making, again, similar devices. They are a little different, but similar devices to study again how superconductivity can be introduced into a semiconductor system. Here's one example. Uh, blue is a superconductor, neonium titanium nitride, very good superconductor. Critical temperature is like 50 Kelvin. We have the nanowire, indium and timonite, and we make contacts to it with gold <coughs> on this side and also on this side. And what you see in this substrate in the back, I hope you can still see my pointer, are the gate electrodes. But these you can you know, change, there you can change the potential, the voltages to you know, make all kinds of potential landscape in your center. And in between, Actually, between the gates and your gold and your wire, there's a dielectric, so there's no leakage from gate to your, you know, your, your nanowire. If you now may do a measurement from here, 
via this dynamo wire out into the superconductor, then what you see is the following. Again, this is a white slide. Uh, uh, probably three weeks old, this data. It's a differential conductor. It's a function of bias voltage between this normal and superconductor contact. At small voltages, electrons have uh, difficulty to get into the superconductor because they have a superconductor gap right there. But at finite voltage, in this case about half a millivolt, you know, the cell can go in, and then there's a normal conductance right there. Also on the left side, a bit deep, but in between, you know, you probe actually the superconducting <coughs> gap in the system. If you take these measurements now as a function of magnetic field, so now the color is uh, uh, the, uh, the differential conductance, you change the magnetic field, then the gap starts to close to smaller values, and uh, there's still something left here, but not much anymore. And so the, there's superconductivity up to about, I don't know, one or two tesla, somewhere in between. There's another measurement, because this measurement with this gap, that, that you only have a, is a tunnel barrier in between the gold and the niobium superconductor. And it really has to be an insulator between the normal and the nanowire insulator. If you take away the insulator, let me just briefly give you some, some uh, without maybe explaining too much, some data that if you take away the tunnel barrier by changing a gauge voltage, so here we have a tunnel barrier, but here we have a lot of conductance, then there's this very interesting region of red. If I go to larger voltages along this vertical axis, you see there is a, a better, more visible. This has no knobs. So we. Uh, yeah? No, no, no. Experimentalist. <laughs> I'm kind of curious. <laughs> All right. Did somebody figure this out? not really usable. Uh, I'll try to use my hands. Uh, and this is actually an interesting region, because I know what the color scale is, and I give you a line cut through here. First I give you a line cut through here, and then I give you a line cut through here. And these are traces that we, uh, you know, you can actually much better see what's going on. Again, it's the conductivity differential conductance in, in units of piece per over H. And if I go into a normal state where superconductivity no longer plays a role at larger voltage, then I see again a nice quantized plateau in, in the system. If I turn on superconductivity, thank you. If I turn on superconductivity, then you see the black curve that at the location of the plateau, there's more conductivity, which is an enhancement. And this is what people know as the Andreas reflections through a point on point contact, where instead of having these charges, single electron charges going through this point on point contact, so there's two E charges, and that enhances the conductance. In the ideal case, by a factor of two, it should go up here, and here it's you know, somewhere in, in between. And this is actually another indication that the wire is clean, and the semiconductor now is very clean because there's a quantized atom. But also the superconductivity is very well developed because this tells you that the transmission of array of states into the superconductor has a very high probability. You can actually deduce a uh, probability of 90%. Okay, so what do we have? If we put all these things together, then we have a nanowire, we have a, a gate electrode right there. And I think about the energy landscape and the uh, filled states. Then I have my tunnel barrier, I induce a tunnel barrier here, the states are all filled up to the Fermi energy in this section of the nanowire up to here. Here at the end of the nanowire, the potential force just shoots to infinity, there it stops. If I make a connection to a superconductor, then the superconductor sends compared into the nanowire, which opens up also a superconducting gap. 
So now the landscape is like this. At the Fermi energy, you have a supercontinuum gap. But at the end of the system, of course, this gap goes to zero. There's, there are no electrons, so that, you, know, you cannot open up the gap. Also on this end. And we know that this end, we again have this particle in a box situation where electrons can you know, bounce back and forth, you know, make a uh, standing wave or, or, or uh, an eigenstate at some fixed energy. At a normal, that's the zero magnetic field. We can now also apply a magnetic field under the right angle, we defined by this canonical interaction, and this superconductivity is no longer an S-wave superconductor, but becomes a P-wave superconductor. The magnetic field makes sure that instead of having this pairing, you get components with this pairing as well. And this pairing, this P-wave superconductor, we call it a topological gap, now has end states of my Uranus at the beginning and at the end. You cannot have anything else but with, with this zero energy solution from Fu and K right there at the Fermi. And these are our Majorana states. All right, this is what we want to measure. This is how the, the, the sample box actually looks like. In reality, this is about a centimeter. You know, we have our nano devices and our wires somewhere in there. And it's, you know, different samples on the same chip. Then you put it in the chip box and you connect wires to it. And that goes into your dilution refrigerator that goes to low temperature, yeah, 10 millikelvin or so, and then you start measuring. And the measurements, you know, to explain the measurements, we do a conductivity measurement where we have a uh, in green, again, our nano wire. This is the superconductor, this is a gold electrode. Here is where we expect our Majorana fermions. In the gold, of course, we have normal electrons, so it's a full circle. And in the superconductor, we have cool. How do we get current? Well, we send an electron from the gold towards this point where it has to somehow combine with a Majorana and form a Kuk pair. How can one electron combine with half an electron into a Kuk pair? Well, if you remember that the half, uh, that the Majorana is uh, a superposition of an electron and a hole, then, uh, then you can, you know, if, if, if this electron picks out this part of the superposition, then it can form Kuk pair. And so everything is conserved in terms of the particles. So the measurement, this is the energy landscape. You may have noticed that I speed up a little bit at the time. The energy measurement of the, the measurement, the electrical measurement at zero magnetic field, so differential conductance, voltage across the system. You see that again, because of the superconductivity in this region, there is a suppression of conductivity right here. It's not all the way to zero, but there's a clear suppression. And here again are the edges of the superconductor and where the gap stops. And this is the superconductor, here's the edge of the superconductor, and the energy is like this. It's this thing. If we now turn on the magnetic field and take many of these traces, then you see that yeah, something is changing up to half the Tesla. First of all, you see that the gap sort of stays. You can see that this peak. Right? But most importantly, around here, and let me highlight it, around zero voltage, zero energy, a peak starts to appear. And this is a super important peak because the peak is at zero energy, right? as you can see. But even, maybe even more important, more characteristic of this peak is that if you change the magnetic field from this value, 50 millitesla, to a few hundred millitesla, the peak doesn't change position. It doesn't change energy at all. And suppose there would be something underlying this peak that would have a spin, a magnetic spin, that, and if you apply a magnet close to it, it will you know, change its energy. It will get some kinetic energy, or you know, some energy from, from the interaction with your, with your magnetic field. So the fact that this peak stays at zero means that the underlying mechanism has no internal degree of freedom that is associated with magnetic moment. And that's the conclusion. No magnetic degrees of freedom. Now I can take one of these curves and uh, do a similar experiment. Now change electric fields. Well, you, we have all these gates. We can change electric fields. And what you see again is that the peak stays at zero. And we're changing the electric field here by a lot. The strength is you know, it's changing the density of the electrons by a lot. But the peak stays at zero. So whatever it means, you know, the underlying uh, origin of the peak has no electric degrees of freedom. It's not electrically charged. So here we already have three of the things that, we, that we're looking for uh, found in this experiment. Is that 
uh, no magnetic moment, it's a zero energy, and no, and no charge. And these are these, these three characteristics. Now you can do many measurements, and that's what, you know, also in, in this paper, and also in uh, the supplementary, there are many, if, you, you know, if you're interested, go to the paper and look at all the data to decide for yourself whether all these measurements are consistent with Amayurana interpretation. That we can do, but I would like to use the remaining minutes to show you a few more recent uh, data sets. So the peak that we had in 2012 was a nice little peak, but not very big. It would be nice to improve our system to get, you know, a peak is actually, theoretically, should actually go up all the way to 2 meters per over age. And it means that, compared to what I showed you, it will be, you know, five, six times, maybe even 10 times bigger. Now that, that means work, right? Because the peak is not, uh, doesn't reach the ideal limit because of some uh, imperfections in your sample, <coughs> which you then have to go after, look for it, do the right diagnosis, and improve your materials and your fabrication. Now uh, we've, we've been lucky to have some, you know, we could go to a company with an FEI, with a very good microscope, uh, and what we found is that if you did a cut through the sample, and you can actually still see the nanowire with hexagonal structure at the bottom. I hope you can still see it there. But the top is rounded off. And the top is rounded off because, you know, before we put up the uh, superconductor, we clean it a little bit with etching, and that makes the top round. And this rounding of the semiconductor, you know, decreases the quality of the induced superconductivity. So we've been working hard, and uh, there have been a very nice result from our collaborators and friends in Copenhagen to make the connection between the superconductor and the semiconductor perfect. They have had a huge success by reaching the limit of apitextual or atomically precise connection between the superconductor and the semiconductor. If you look at all these dots, these, are, these dots are atoms, and you see that the pattern of dots on this side and the pattern of dots on that side are correlated, there's an angle here, but you can see that you know, there's a matching of these two crystal structures. And this gives you, uh, it turns out, a very beautiful superconducting gap inside the sample. I want to show you yeah, some, some, just some, you know, some quick scans, scans of data if you improve the sample. It's all you know, in color code, so you know, I hope you, if you've never seen it before, it's probably very difficult to understand what you're seeing, but you know, enjoy the red, white, blue color. It's a connectivity, the, the IDT is a function of magnetic field, and here's the bias voltage. At zero magnetic field, there are just two peaks, which are these, you know, these Andreev bound states you know, between uh, the induced superconductivity and the tunnel barrier. If you change magnetic field, they come together, then go to zero. This is the point where the Majorana starts to appear, at zero magnetic field, and at five magnetic field with a zero bound voltage, if you look closely, there's some structure. If I uh, change the orientation of the magnetic field, not along the <coughs> axis of the wire, but perpendicular to the wire, up into, let's say, the z direction, then, you know, it's, it's different, definitely, but it's kind of similar. Uh, it's, there's, there's splitting here, stuff at or near zero down there. If I change it in the y direction, and in the y direction uh, is actually the direction where also this, this spin orbit interaction, this spin orbit interaction you can also associate with a vector, and that vector, I've already used it but not explained it, is this vector PSO. If you put your external magnetic field along the same axis, then this whole idea of you know, creating this gap or this helical structure doesn't work anymore. So there should not be any Majorana if the magnetic field is oriented along PSO. And indeed, as a function of the magnetic field, with, with the uh, amplitude of the magnetic field in the y direction, this, this state actually goes to zero, but it doesn't stay at zero. It just crosses and then, you know, it, it goes again to finite energy. So indeed, if you don't expect it, there are no minus. This is a, a, no, another set of data. It's a, sometimes it's easier to look at, at, let's say, these curves compared to the in the, the color plots, but you know, actually this, in this resolution is also not so easy to see, but here you see a peak appearing. Uh, if you, out of this zoo of peaks, which are a fine field, you pick a nice curve, you see that indeed 
by improving these materials and interfaces, the peak is now a lot bigger than we had before in 2012. And this is now two or three times bigger than the background in the normal state, it really exceeds it, whereas before it was a inside effect, a small compass. Uh, that's a significant thing. This thing about the angles, that it shouldn't be there in a certain direction of magnetic field, but it should be there in other directions, you can explicitly test by rotating the magnetic field. So if you have your nanowire in this direction, and I change the magnetic field uh, in a plane XZ, XZ that is, that is well, let me see, XZ that is out of plane, that is, that is in this plane. XZ is in this plane, whereas the B is all points in this direction. So you always, if your magnetic field perpendicular to the B is all vector. And indeed, what you see for all angles from zero to two pi, you see the zero by its peak, it's small, sometimes a small split, always there. If I do it in the other plane, so now I do it in this plane, I sometimes hit the, the, uh, the value for uh, the same direction as PSO, then I only see the two discrete points. And so you see that there is a huge and distinct difference between the directions, because in the direction of the field, what you mentioned. And this is a very significant and characteristic uh, property of these myelinas in this system, according to this recipe from uh, Blue Chin and Oil. So what do we have? Have we followed the recipe? We've not, you know, we've, we've avoided doing anything creative or smart. I mean, we've, we've, we followed the recipe. We have the four ingredients. If you put them together in the right amount, you get the zero bias peak. And at the moment, you know, there's, there's no alternative uh, explanation for this peak as a Majorana, uh, than a Majorana explanation. For instance, it's important to know that if you take one of these ingredients out, yeah, for instance, the spin orbit attraction, if you align the field along that axis, you effectively take out the spin orbit attraction, then, you know, it's gone. So it's really the combination of those ingredients that gives you the, uh, the uh, emerging uh, myoramas. All right. I'm looking at the time. And, um, what I'm skipping is uh, how you can actually use these myoramas for quantum. Mm -hmm. I promise <laughs> it will take a long time. I think, you know, it's 10 years. It will take me 10 years, so I can, I can come back in now. <laughs> but I promise to say something about the man. Uh, because we, uh, there was this man in Toro Mayran. We now know that he was still living in the 50s. But what we did when we published, uh, uh, or when we submitted this, this paper to science, we also um, submitted a uh, suggestion for the cover. And so some, one of the students, made a nice cover. I actually like this cover much more, with a different version, <coughs> with the real device with nice colors. Uh, but one student actually yeah, had a creative mood. <laughs> and then, you know, we put it a blocks there, you know, it looks, I don't know, kind of crazy. But you know, the art director of science obviously <laughs> liked it. <laughs> but this art director of science missed a thing, because what she missed was actually there was a hidden uh, uh, you know, I call it a hidden you know, signature of Majorana himself. The title of the paper was Signatures of Majorana Firmness, but the cover actually had a hidden signature of Majorana himself. So you didn't see it. But if you look closely, and of course, where should you look for Majorana? At the end of the wire, of course. And if you zoom in, you actually didn't see it. There is Majorana, clearly visible in, in 2012. And that's how it looked a long time ago. So with this tribute to Ettore Majorana, I'd like to thank you for your attention on this great Friday afternoon. Thank you.